How many of you have no clue and it's all right to raise your hand and say, I don't know what you're talking about. We will pray for your deliverance. Oh, the Blues Brothers. They were on a mission. Amen? A mission from? God. Say it again. A mission from? God. You have to get, oh, if you haven't seen the movie, I sell everything you own and buy a ticket. And if you don't want to go see the Blues Brothers, my wife and I can uh, heartily recommend you go see 42. Everybody say that. 42. It's worth the price of the ticket. I remember when the movie The Blues Brothers came out, and I had a lot of fun watching Jake and Elwood. They were putting their band back together. Uh, it's a lot of fun. But one of the things that we want to talk about today in our service, and one of the things we're going to reflect on as Jesus' Uh, appearances, those, those wonderful stories that, that follow the resurrection event where Jesus is beginning to, to, to interact with his followers, with his disciples, getting them ready for his departure. We're going to remember that just like these Blues Brothers, we're on a mission as well. We're on a mission from God. Today we're going to talk about the Great Commission. And if we're a little bit honest with ourselves, we'll talk about some of our great omissions. By the time we finish service today, you're going to have to go to the doctor just to get the grin off your face. Welcome to season. <laughs> Seen something that has been mislabeled? Just got the wrong name on it? Have you ever run into that? Just flat, flat out seen something mislabeled? What does that say, Sean? That is not devil's food cake. That is the that is the food of the angels. I don't know why they call something so good devil's food. And just it's, you know what the really neat thing about this box is? No, it's what? It's empty. And that means where's the cake? You're not getting any. You know that weird little thing we were working with the, uh, the youth before? We have a recipe given to us. And we look at the ingredients and we make a decision. And sometimes we get it right. And sometimes it really does not come out well at all. Churches throughout the ages have done several things with the Great Commission. With Jesus' instructions to go and make disciples. Some have taken the box and just simply set it on the shelf and just left it there. Others have taken the box and, well, they've opened it up. But they threw away the instructions and just decided to strike out on their own. Figuring they could figure this out by themselves. Others have taken the ingredients and the instructions, the directions. They've taken the recipe, but then they've begun to add their own little extra ingredients to it. Sometimes the mission gets watered down. We're going to talk about the Great Commission this morning. And I'm going to share with you what I think are three misunderstandings that we have about it sometime. Let's have a word of prayer. Gracious God, we give you thanks for your word read to us this day. We give you word, thanks for your word that's been lived out in our midst by our youth for this 30-hour famine. So bless the hearing and the reading of your word, God. Bless the hearing and the doing of your word, God. And give fresh strength and wind to your messenger this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I read a lot. A variety of books sometimes. I've got one entitled 1356 on my uh, nightstand right now that I'm working hard getting through. It's one of those historical fiction novels that's set in medieval France right now. I'm reading about some of my uh, ancestors and boy they weren't really very nice people. Um, I read a lot of uh, just news commentaries like many of you do and I read a variety of, of books by various authors and one of the authors that I read not long ago was Dr. Kenda Creechie Dean. Dr. Dean is an 
ordained elder in the United Methodist Church, and she teaches theology at Princeton University. The title of her book alone caught my attention, Almost Christian. It's the exact same title that the Reverend John Wesley preached, I think it was about 1741. Almost Christian. And I read that book, and I began to take a, a serious look at it. Dr. Creech, uh, excuse me, Dr. Dean has spent her life working with youth. She has spent her life researching the religious, religious faith and development of our youth in our churches. And so she takes a serious uh, uh, look at what's going on. In this particular book, she studied the theological beliefs, the, the background, the faith of our youth in our churches today. And she calls it this. It is a hodgepodge of banal, self-serving, feel-good beliefs that bear little resemblance to traditional Christianity. That's a pretty hard poke in the eye. I want to read that again. The faith of our youth is little more than a hodgepodge of banal, self-serving, feel-good beliefs that bears little resemblance to traditional Christianity. In her book, she explores the why? Where did their youth kind of get to that point? This misguided, watered-down version of Christianity, as she calls it. Her research over a span of decades reveals something that should at best get our attention. Because Dr. Dean does not blame the youth or the teenagers. She puts the blame squarely on the churches themselves for the theological watering down of the gospel. Instead of proclaiming a God who calls his followers, his believers, to lives of love, ser service, and sacrifice, churches have begun to offer a bargain religion, easy to use, easy to forgive, offering little, demanding even less. Dean argues in her book, that churches must rediscover their sense of mission and model. And understanding of being Christian is not something you do for yourself, but something that calls you to share God's love in word and in deed with others. The words almost Christian, whether it's that book that scorched my fingers when I tried to turn the pages one by one, or whether it's the sermon by Reverend Wesley that I've read a number of times that twists my heart. It's a wake-up call. It's a wake-up call <laughs> about the future of Christianity. Remember this. Jesus did not emphasize a do-good, feel-good spirituality at the expense of a deep discipleship. Jesus had something more in mind. We heard the words read from Matthew. You can find that same commission, that same story, those same and basic instructions in the other Gospels. You can also find it in Acts. Jesus left instructions. Jesus left clear instructions, concise, crystal clear instructions. And we have called it throughout the ages the Great Commission. Let's think for just a moment about what I will call three misunderstandings of the Great Commission that is found in the Gospels. Number one, Jesus did not say, well, just go to church and be nice people. That's not what Jesus said. Just go to church. I want to tell you two things. Number one, going to church is a good thing. Number two, being nice is a real good thing. But that's not what Jesus said. So many have begun to believe that this is what we were called to. Just to be nice people and a little more than that. We've got a great generation that don't even go to church and think that that's all there is. Jesus said what? Go and make disciples. Discipleship begins where? It begins with me. 
and it begins to spread. I love the message that Pastor Keith gave in the traditional service this morning. When he talked about taking small steps, small things, these youth realize they're not going to be able to feed all of the hungry with their 30-hour famine. But they took a small step. And they will make a difference in the life of somebody, somewhere. And so Jesus said, go and make disciples. He didn't say, just kick back now and be nice people. He said, be active. Be active. And Jesus didn't say, you know, those things that I taught you while I was with you, after I'm gone, you can do whatever you want to. Jesus didn't say that. He didn't say, once I'm gone, you can do what you want. Jesus said, go and make disciples. And He also said, and teach them all I have commanded. You know that thing about love your neighbors? I meant that. That thing about feeding the hungry and clothing the naked? I meant that too. Jesus spent so much time teaching. And you know one of the things that Jesus did? He taught in so many different ways. He took some of the simplest messages and just kept repeating them over and over and over. Like a good teacher in a good classroom just came back with the same. Didn't we learn? Didn't we talk about this last week? Yeah, we did. Darlene tells a, a wonderful story about the preacher that preached a sermon once. And after it was over with, everybody in the congregation loved it. They screamed, they whistled, they cheered. People were handing the pastor money after the service. <laughs> Imagine that, handing your pastor money. <laughs> and when it's over with, people were going home and they were, it was the rain of that sermon in the community that week. The next week they came back and he preached the same sermon again. And people went, wow, that's a nice sermon. Didn't get money that week. Third week, fourth week, guess what? The same sermon every week. And finally, the council met with him and said it's a great sermon we enjoyed it but why do you keep preaching the same sermon over and over when are you going to give us a new sermon and the pastor said when are you going to do something with my first sermon <laughs> Jesus kept going back over and over these things he taught them parables he demonstrated love he demonstrated compassion he demonstrated how to relate and, 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 and work with other people. He taught us how to work with people we may not like, with whom we may have incredible disagreements. He modeled for us what love was. When Jesus left, Jesus didn't say, now that I'm gone, change the rules and just do whatever you want to. Jesus said, no, teach. Teach them all. I have commanded you. And third thing, Jesus did not say, you're on your own. You're on. Moms, dad, your kids go off to college. Do you ever say that to them? Hey, you're on your own now. And we know full well they're not on their own because the minute they run out of money, they're coming back home. Uh, Jesus did not abandon them. The Holy Spirit came in a new and powerful way. Jesus did not abandon His followers in that day. Jesus does not abandon us in our mission today. Lo, He said, I am with you. When? Always. Always. You're reading your Bibles. Jesus did not say, you're going to have to figure this out by yourself. I've been with you. I've taught you. And I will continue to be with you. One of the things I love about that little moment on the road to Emmaus when Jesus appears to those travelers, they talk about how in their presence He began to explain the Scriptures and how their hearts and their eyes became open and alive. They began to fully understand everything. They began to understand it so much better. Jesus did not say, just go to church and be nice people. Jesus didn't say, you know, now that I'm not around anymore, you can just kind of do whatever you want to do. Jesus didn't say, you're going to have to do this on your own. Jesus did not do that. 
last Wednesday. Had the neatest time. I had a date with my wife. And we went out to dinner. We met her brother, fiance, in San Marcos. What was the name of that restaurant? The, the Root Cellar. And we uh, took off to San Marcos to go over there to eat. And I ran into the most unusual sight in Seguin, a traffic jam. <laughs> I didn't know you had traffic jams in Seguin. Well, I've learned where not to go and turn, you know, but this was a bona fide die in the wool, one and a half mile an hour traffic jam. And we pull off on the 123 bypass, we're kind of right in front of the uh, Randolph Brooks Credit Union there, and traffic is just stacked up. And I mean, cars, big trucks, there's this chicken truck from out there, and I mean, and it's way up there, and you're looking for the flashing red lights, you're looking for the uh, the wreck, you're looking, what's going on here? What's called, and I mean, finally that car pulls off this way and kind of goes around, and a few cars are there, everybody's swinging a little to the left, nobody's swinging to the right, so that tells you there's something what, kind of on the right, that, I didn't know what we were going to run up on. And gradually, as we got a little closer, there was this little dog going down the middle of the road, just as lost and scared as he could be. And all he would do to do was follow his nose. And I mean, that traffic was just piled up. One car had already pulled off to the side. There was a lady out in it, and she was out there going, come on, sweetie, come on. She was calling. Another man had finally put his car in a ditch. I don't know what he did. I can't remember where he parked. And he was getting out, trying to help the other direction. My wife has a cell phone in one hand. She has her hand on the doorknob, one foot out of the door. I mean, she's fixing it. I'm, I have visions of another puppy uh, spending the night uh, at the holiday welfare. And people were doing the best they could to avoid hitting that little lost pup. Now, I am more than certain there were people in those cars going, where's their owner? They're so irresponsible. They ought to be put in jail. Others were going, you know, if that dog gets hit, it's just too bad. It's just a stupid dog and shouldn't be out here anyhow. And there were others going, that little pup needs help. It's just that simple. It's just that simple. I remember the words of the lady that was just off to the side. By the way, they did catch the little pup and uh, rescue it. The man finally got hold of it. And the lady said, he's got tags on. And I'll see that he gets home safely. I'll see that he gets home safely. Isn't that our task? Isn't that what we are called to do for one another? And isn't it time we began to take that call seriously and not water down the commission that we've been given? Isn't it time that we said, no, we can't feed all of the hungry, but we can sure do a better job than we've been doing you know, one of the things I'm really looking forward to already in just, what, another couple of weeks, our mobile food pantry will be back in the parking lot over here. And we'll continue that ministry. We need to help as many as we can to enjoy the fullness of life that God has intended for each and every one of us right now. And I like the little concept of taking small steps that Pastor Steve gave us because we can begin just to the north of Crestorn over here. We can go just to the south of College Street, to the west of Camp, and east of Austin. Those are good starting points. Christianity really was never intended to be a religion, I don't think, but more a way of living. And it's a way of living that changes the world. The watered-down version that the church has often offered the world has become a stagnant pond at times. And it needs a recharge of living water. With Pentecost just around the corner, it might be a good time for us to shake off the mantle of almost Christian. 
they become, they become born again. We extend the invitation to Christian discipleship to you. If you're already a member of the church, a chance to re recommit yourself and rededicate yourself to the war work that Christ has, has left us with. If you're looking for a church home, we would invite you to come and join us here at First United Methodist Church, and I'd be glad to receive you in membership by either ways we transfer membership from other Christian denominations. We're going to sing a closing song here. What are we singing, John? Shout to the Lord. Let's Shout to the Lord. I advise you to stand and sing.